Joseph Moleketi. I am the chair of the Mapungupwe Advisory Council. I'd like to welcome you all here this evening because I believe that this is an evening where there'll be much discussion, debate, and well, let's see how it goes. So I want to start out by recognizing all of you, but in particular, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg, Professor Chilitsi Marwala. It's his first as uh, Vice Chancellor and Principal, and we are honored as Mapungupwe, as the Mapungupwe Institute of Strategic Reflections, that you are here with us this evening and join us at this debate. We know that you've been walking with us along the road that uh, Mistra has traveled since its uh, inception. But before I call you up to um, welcome us to this university that's doing very interesting things, I'd like to recognize um, the chair of the Board of Governors of uh, Mistra, um, Professor Villankomo, Sibusiso Villankomo is in the audience here, and the rest of the members of the Board of Governors, there are quite a few who are present here tonight. I'd also want to recognize the chair of the Tabumbeki uh, Foundation, uh, Dr. Brigalia Bam, who has joined us. And I know that there are a number of other people I should acknowledge and recognize. I do want to recognize the CEO, uh, Mr. Joel Nechitenje, the CEO of Mistra, and the management team of Mistra. But I think the most important people here tonight, other than our keynote speaker who I'll be introducing in a few minutes' time, are all of you who've decided to join us here as we uh, um, have this engaging 2018 annual lecture. So Prof, uh, there are many Profs here, but uh, Prof uh, Chilitsi Marwala, um, there's a lot to be said about you. And we can actually spend the whole night to talk about you, you know, in terms of your various incarnations. But I think that just for the benefit of the audience, you know that he's previously been the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization, as well as the Dean of Engineering at the University of Johannesburg and Professor of Electrical Engineering. He holds various degrees and is a postdoctoral research associate at the Imperial College of Science, Technology and Medicine. He's supervised numerous masters and PhD students to completion and has published over 300 technical papers and 12 books. Now I want to mention one of those books, so I'm not going to go on for too much longer. The one book he co-authored on modeling interstate conflict has been translated into Chinese by the National Defense Industry Press. We'll hear some more about that on a future occasion, Prof, to just get about, uh, more about that. So safe to say that tonight I call on uh, Professor Chilitsi Marwala, the Vice Chancellor and Principal of UJ to welcome us as we start this evening. Thank you. San Bonan. I know Mr. Joel Nishtenji does not understand what I am saying. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, Chair of Mr. Professor Villinkomo. Uh, when I was a young man, I think I was 17 years old, and uh, I was going to do my undergraduate uh, degree uh, in the United States, the person who came to JFK to pick me up was Professor uh, Villingoma. Uh, thank you very much. I think you should give me a round of applause. 
Mr. Uh, board members, uh, uh, Dr. Fraser Mulekiti, she used to be my boss <laughs> uh, when I was uh, a director of, uh, of CETA uh, so many years ago. It's good to see you. Um, and, and I can see also uh, our former uh, chairperson of uh, the IEC, uh, Dr. Brigalia Bam. She is actually um, the, the holder of Ellen Kuzayo Award at the University of Johannesburg. I think we should give her a round of applause. <laughs> I also see uh, the presence of the youngest deputy vice chancellor for, for research in the country, Professor Sorab Sina. He was also the dean of the Faculty of Engineering and the Built env Environment. You can see where the trajectory is going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, Professor Sina, when he became a dean, he was also the vice president of the IEEE, uh, Institute of Electrical Electronics and Electrical Engineers. So he had two offices, one here, one in Manhattan. So you used to go to New York every two weeks to make sure that uh, uh, that other job was, uh, was in place. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of um, Dr. Musibudi Mangena. It's not Mangena, it's Mangena, isn't it? And it is quite important. And most importantly, I would like to welcome the presence of um, our speaker, Tsitsi Dangadam. Um, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, it is quite a great deal of honor for you to come and speak to us. Uh, here we have uh, people who are coming from technology and at the University of Johannesburg, we want our students to understand both humanities and technology. Because our strategy as the University of Johannesburg is basically to take the University of Johannesburg into the fourth industrial revolution. And this is quite important. And when we proposed this strategy, people were saying, but you are bringing too much technology into our, uh, into our university. But uh, I think the fourth industrial revolution is not about technology. It is about taking technology to humanities and taking humanities to technology. So it's about merging the two. Now, what is this fourth industrial revolution that we want to, to take the University of Johannesburg? The first industrial revolution actually happened in England. Very small island. Uh, it's quite mind boggling that uh, uh, it happened in such a small area. In fact, if you go and interact with the British, and I was uh, I was a PhD student and a postdoc in, in England. You even wondered how they conquered the world. <laughs> if you just walk into the pub, you will wonder what really <laughs> happened. <laughs> Were we sleeping, you know? Uh, but the reason why it happened in England was not in Beijing or in, uh, in New Delhi, which where it was supposed to happen if we were to look at population densities was because uh, uh, the British uh, had allowed scientific thought to flourish. So the laws of motion from Newton had happened. They had been discovered. Uh, of course, they were not written in English because uh, at that point, English was not deemed to be fit enough to write scientific uh, language. It was actually written in, in Latin. Uh, the laws of thermodynamics were, were well understood. And what we got from the first industrial revolution was actually steam engines, mechanization of production. The second industrial revolution also happened uh, with ideas that came from England. Of course, it was uh, industrialized in the United States. Um, uh, a gentleman by the name uh, Father Day realized that if you have a magnet and something that conducts electricity and you move that conductor, it generates electricity. Even up to today, much of the electricity we consume is generated by moving a conductor next to, an to a ne next to a magnet. 
whether you do that by burning coal and heating uh, uh, water uh, that becomes steam and move a conductor next to, uh, to a magnet or whether it is by using hydro, it is all magnet uh, and movement that give us electricity. Now, the third industrial revolution gave us, uh, this is what they call the digital industrial revolution. So the digital industrial revolution is not the fourth industrial revolution. And now we are at the fourth industrial revolution. And the driver of the fourth industrial revolution is actually artificial intelligence. I remember many, many years ago, this must be uh, 18 years ago, I an encountered Mr. Nishita and he said, what did you do your PhD on? I said artificial intelligence. He seemed to be confused. <laughs> <laughs> But of course now we know that artificial intelligence is commonplace. It means almost everything around us is going to be automated. It means when we educate our students, they will have to understand both humanities and uh, social sciences as well as technology. Because it is about the convergence of men and machines. If you are talking about the convergence of men and machines, you have to understand a person and you have to understand machines. This is really what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. We all know that uh, as a country, we were objects of the first, the second, and the third industrial revolution, rather than subjects. We cannot afford to be uh, objects of the fourth industrial revolution. Now, why is this fourth industrial revolution important for the topic we are dealing with today, the topic of race, gender, and class. At the beginning, at the end of last year, I got a gift from the Deputy Vice Chancellor. It was a Google device that I can talk to. I can almost give it all the instructions. So every morning I will go to it and I will say, so tell me, Google, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg? <laughs> It will get uh, confused, and then it will say, Iron Rensberg. Of course, you can imagine I was not a happy child. Now it does say Chili Zimarwal. <laughs> but the thing about this device is that if I ask it about African names, it doesn't seem to understand it. So the issue of, um, of class is getting into technology. If I say, tell me who is John Smith, it answers very instantly. But if I were to ask, um, tell me, who is uh, former minister Mabanda? Uh, former minister? Uh, it would not be able to know. Uh, because uh, it was not trained on African names. So the issue of race, gender, and class is actually getting into the fourth industrial revolution. And unless unless our graduates actually understand literature, as we are going to be talking about literature, uh, if, unless it understands class, unless it understands uh, uh, um, uh, gender, then all the things that we have observed in the third and the first and the second industrial revolutions are going to be just reproduced in the fourth industrial revolution. And I don't think we can be able to afford that. So as we move forward to eliminate uh, discrimination of names in these machines, to make sure that uh, our voices are included, our accents are included in such devices, we have to understand issues not just of technology, but issues of society. And today, we really are going to be engaged in absolutely fantastic conversation on how can we be able to use the written word to advance ourselves. Because one of the things that um, we actually went and begged for this lecture to come to University of Johannesburg because originally it used to happen at Vets University. The reason why we did that is because 
we take very seriously as the University of Johannesburg the issue of the written word. A story told to four different people becomes four different stories. So this concept of oral history, I don't think it will serve us as we move forward. We need to write. As I am sitting here, I am um, looking at people that I am just asking myself, when is your biography coming out? And when it comes out, who will be excited to launch it? So that other people can be able to share with, uh, with uh, what you have written. Uh, Barry uh, has set an example for us. Music and revolution are a toxic combination. And we actually launched this book, and it was fantastic, you know, and we want to do more. Uh, uh, and we also want your, your book too, uh, so that we can be able to launch it, and, uh, and future generations can actually benefit from your experience. This is what it is all about. This is what the University of Johannesburg is all about. So with those few words, thank you very much, Mistra, for choosing to partner with the University of Johannesburg. I think this partnership is working very, very well. The room is becoming fuller and fuller the more years we add to this partnership. And we are hoping that uh, it will continue to expand. Uh, and we are going to continue to do many, many things together, many lectures together. This is not just uh, the only lecture we do with Mistra. We do many lectures with Mistra. So thank you very much for choosing us. And I am looking forward to uh, the engagement and to the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to start on a lighter note. You've consciously seen I've avoided this white lectern. Um, that's because of my height, just in case you wondered, yeah? Um, Titi, I'm not suggesting anything. Uh, just thought I'd make the point. But uh, Prof, thanks. Um, as usual, you've made the link between technology, science, and those issues that we confront in everyday life, realities we thought that would be behind us, but is part of the current discourse, the issues of race, class, gender. And yes, indeed, Mr. really appreciates the partnership it has with the University of Johannesburg. Now, you know, after the example you gave of Google not recognizing names, I'm a little bit anxious around the pronunciation of Tsitsi's surname. But I'm going to try. Um, this evening, I would like to um, introduce Tsitsi Danga Remba. She's an author playwright, poet, activist, and filmmaker. And as you're all aware, and I know that you have her bio data on the little uh, um, uh, leaflet that was given or uh, handed out outside, you know she's currently the founder and CEO of the Institute of Creative Arts for Progress in Africa and the founder of a production house uh, Nerai Films. She founded Tikapa in uh, 2014 with a collection of short stories, a family portrait that interrogated the many endemic forms of violence in Zimbabwe. And our con her contribution to the collection is a short story called The Brick. And she's currently writing Sai Sai and Watermaker, a dystopic speculative fiction for young adults. Now, yesterday I sat through a Scufton session at Mistra and listened to you together with the Mistra team. And contrary to what popular perception may be, the Mistra team is not 
Joel and myself and that age uh, trajectory. There's actually a large group of considerably younger people who are part of the Mistra team. And they challenged Tsitsi quite a bit. And I think uh, we're really looking forward to the issues that will come up. But one of the quote, quotes from uh, Tsitsi is one that says, and I quote, we cannot redress the mistakes of the past. We must deal with the requirements of the moment. Oh gosh, this is standing at the wrong place and I'm moving. Okay, I'm not going to touch anything further. I think it's a sign that I should stop as well. But I think uh, there's a number of people who would like to probably hear you and challenge you on this. Because the one novel that many of us has, uh, have read is the one, of course, Nervous Conditions. And it's described as a novel pregnant with themes such as feminism, class, race, colonialism, and identity amongst others, close quotes. So we're really looking forward to listening to you, and I think I shouldn't stand between you and the audience or between you and this overhead presentation. So thank you very much. Right, I think I'm all set. Good evening, everyone. It's a, a great honor for me to be with you tonight. And for that honor, I am extremely grateful to the Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection and to the University of Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Um, I would like also to acknowledge the board of directors and the vice chancellor, thank you. Um, this evening, I will share some thoughts on nervous conditions the burden of race, class, and gender in the construction of the post-colonial order. Now, the paper I prepared is rather long because that's a huge topic, and so I'm going to present an abbreviated form of it. I hope all go goes well as I edit going through, standing here in front of you. And I will send the paper to Mistra, and I hope that Mistra will be able to make it available if anybody should want to um, engage more with it. The conclusion I will present to you this evening is that we can have the Africa we want. We can be the Africans we want to be in the nations and communities we want to have on the continent that we desire. As South Africans know very well, it's possible. Indeed, it is possible in spite of our nervous conditions. Having the Africa we want and being the Africans we want to be in that Africa is going to require a little work though. It is that work that I am going to engage with this evening. I will begin by defining a nervous condition. I will go on to look briefly at the incidence of nervous conditions on the continent. I will then engage critically with the notion of post-colonialism, referring to two main challenges I have with the notion. I will be reframing the arguments. I'm sure many of you are more familiar with them than I am since you're studying these issues but I will be reframing the arguments from my own perspective. And this will lead me to formulate my understanding of the era in which we find ourselves. I will use the following concepts. The colonized protagonist, the colonizing antagonist, the colonized mind, the colonizing mind, guerrilla state, and internal colonization. I will argue that Africa is facing, in the first instance, not a crisis of leadership, but a crisis of personhood. 
I will map briefly the role of leadership and the people in the genesis of this crisis and will end by proposing a remedy for the crisis. In proposing a remedy, I will invoke Zaitz Dar's concept of justifying the enemy. I will end with a note on gender. So, definition of nervous conditions, you can read it for yourself. Um, I don't want to read everything, and you all know anyway, intuitively, and some people are studying these things. Uh, I think the important aspect of this slide is that human beings experience nervous conditions as distressing, and therefore human beings take action to dispel these nervous conditions. Those are some of the environmental factors that cause nervous conditions. And um, these are all factors that we have in abundance on our continent, you can see. And the, they escalate, starting with poor nutrition, going down to war. We have many of those on our continent. Now, I'd just like to have a look at the incidence of mental illness, which is actually quite shocking. According to the UN online magazine, Africa Renewal, Kenyan health experts estimate that one-fourth, 25% of the population in Kenya suffers from a range of mental diseases. South Africa, the estimate is at 33% of the population. Zimbabwe, I've got um, a figure here of 20%. But um, Zimbabweans are rather coy with stating things as they are. <laughs> and so the prevalence is most probably higher. That 20% comes from um, a publication in the Herald, an article in the Herald newspaper of January 4 this year. And it was an article written by Dr. Sacrifice Chirisa. And um, he noted that 18.7% of all years of life lost to disability and premature mort mortality um, come from nervous conditions. And this premature mortality is suicide. Um, I've got some figures on suicide, which are also very shocking. This is per 100,000 of the population. So we see that these nervous conditions can actually be fatal, and they are something we have to deal with. And note, under 35, so obviously it is something that is affecting the youth. So um, we do need to engage with it. But just to go back to Zimbabwe, um, I heard a joke some time ago and it was at a time when I was working for an organization called Women Filmmakers of Zimbabwe. And we had put out a call to Zimbabwean women for documentaries on themes that they felt were important for their well-being. We received a concept for a documentary on postnatal depression. And it was during research on this project that I heard a joke when I was speaking to mental health pr practitioners. And it goes like this. 33% of Zimbabweans are on antidepressants. 33% are on alcohol. And the other 33% are on both. <laughs> More recently, a journalist in Zimbabwe has made a wonderful documentary on mental illness called State of Mind. And yes, in case you asked, that documentary filmmaker is male. Um, on this slide, just to go back, the rate for Kenya there, the suicide rate, 6.5. This is interesting, high incidence of mental illness, but low um, uh, mortality rate from suicide. Maybe they are getting something right. You know how it is with statistics in our part of the world, but that's what we have to guide us. 
So that little introduction is just to underscore the importance of finding ways to engage with mental illness and preferably before these nervous conditions actually become mental illness and um, result in people, especially young people, taking their lives. Now I'm going to go on to the post-colonial order. The category post-colonial is one I am increasingly contesting, as have so many others. My two main criticisms are the following. Firstly, at the theoretical level, I do not understand how a system that transforms itself into another version of itself can be perceived of as being post itself. <laughs> European colonization of Africa has only been modified. It has not come to an end. The purpose of colonization was to transfer wealth from where it was found outside the colonizing countries into the colonizing countries. Today, we still see that net movement of wealth. The colonial system may have changed in that it has adjusted some of its more excessive practices, such as direct rule, legal rendering of local populations as less than human, apartheid practices, and genocide. There are, today, more individuals across the globe who are toiling to end the work of colonialism. However, the purposes of colonization are still served today by systems that were adopted following the end of direct colonialism. Therefore, the system of colonialism has merely changed, but it is still in existence. To my mind, being told we are in the post-colonial era is an integral part of a strategy to keep that colonial system functional. If we all believe it is over, we will not look to dismantle it. We will concentrate on other things. Here, we see the power of naming in effect. Those who have the power to name are those who have the power to determine. The term post-colonialism is said to have emerged in the 1970s in response to cultural production that dealt with the relationship between the colonized protagonist and the colonizing antagonist. Emanating from the academy of the 1970s, it is unlikely that many colonized protagonists were part of this academic conversation. The naming then was done by individuals who were part of or, at the very least, who were beneficiaries of the colonial project. The appearance of the term post-colonial in the 1970s followed a period of fundamental change in the nature of colonization as a response to transformations in economic imperatives caused by both technological advances and also by actions for independence undertaken by colonized protagonists, as well as by their allies who resided within colonizing antagonistic nations. The term originated out of engagement by the academy with the works of such anti-colonialism writers as Fanon, Said, and Spivak, within the academy itself. In the field of fiction, representatives of the canon are such writers as Achebe, Odanchi, Allende, Kutsia, and Walcott. In the area of nonfiction, Kincaid is a notable figure. The explicit term, post-colonial, does not occur often in the early texts of these writers. 
Fanon writes of a dying colonialism. Said uses the term on page 275 of his seminal work, Orientalism. Said says, Oriental studies were to be thought of not so much as scholarly activities, but as instruments of national policy towards the newly independent and possibly intractable nations of the post-colonial world. With this statement, Said analyzed how colonial forces that had given up political control of the nations they had colonized were repositioning themselves for continued engagement under the banner of post-colonialism. Clearly, this term was coined in order to enable a conversation about a particular historical epoch. Nevertheless, it was the colonizing antagonist and not the colonized protagonist speaking. I have used the phrase colonized protagonist several times. This is the result of a choice I have made not to use the term colonial subject. My reason for this choice is that a subject has an architect. A subject is propounded by a principle that is prior, that exists before the subject. This prior principle is a mind. It is an intelligence that thinks. This intelligence perceives objects in its universe and it positions these objects with respect to itself and with respect to each other. This mind enunciates positions of objects and the relationships between objects to the one who acts. This one who acts is the subject. Thus, the subject is created by the mind that moves it. The mind is the first actor. A colonial subject would therefore be she who is created by the colonial mind. A protagonist, however, is the first or principal actor moved by her own mind to order the universe according to her own principles. In the world of the colonized protagonist, there are, for, there are therefore two minds, or at least two minds, in operation. The first is the mind of the protagonist prior to colonization. The second is the mind of the colonizing antagonist. This is a situation of conflict. It begets the nervous conditions thematized this evening. Nevertheless, a colonized protagonist does not inevitably give up her mind to the colonial universe. A colonized protagonist has a choice whether to become a colonial subject or whether to continue to be her own subject who orders the universe in accordance with her own principles. Both choices come with costs. From this point of view, I am more comfortable with the term neocolonialism as opposed to postcolonialism. My second concern with the notion of post-colonialism flows from the first. It is my submission that the objectives of colonization are being served by the new powers within many of the former colonized countries. <coughs> there are two principal ways of looking at this. 
One way regards the new governments as agents of the colonizer, intent on extracting wealth from the south to the north for the benefit of the north. The second perspective sees the new governments as new colonial agents themselves, intent on extracting wealth from the south for their own benefit. This wealth often ends up in the north as well, but their primary concern is to extract wealth from the country for, for themselves. In either case, we can see the colonial antagonistic mind at work. The trajectory of events in Zimbabwe leads me to argue that the Zimbabwean government, and indeed maybe governments elsewhere on the continent, fall into the second category. I'll expand on this idea. Zimbabwe's leadership was and is of a specific nature. The Zimbabwean armed struggle against the colonial antagonist was waged from 1966 to 1979. Those who left the country to lead the armed struggle became, in effect, the leaders of an establishment that can be thought of as a Zimbabwean state in exile. This state in exile was able to raise an army. It exacted donations from Zimbabweans both within the pre-independent state and outside it. As these donations were necessary to the exiled state in order for it to continue to run and to pursue its objectives, the payments that the exiled state extracted can be regarded as a kind of taxation or tribute. Such contributions were often freely given. However, within the pre-independent state and not outside it, sanctions frequently followed failure to comply with the demand for contributions. And it was common for these sanctions to be of a brutal nature. The situation here is that of a military state having been effectively created outside the borders of Zimbabwe, led by a military government that was also situated outside the physical boundaries of the country. I call this entity the guerrilla state. It is this guerrilla state that reinvented itself as ZANU-PF, the political party, in the last phases of the armed struggle and which took control of the nation at independence. The occupation of a nation by an extractive guerrilla state that had previously claimed to be waging a guerrilla war in the name of the people it occupies is what I call internal colonization. How did this state of internal colonization, colonization come about when Zimbabwe was the hope of many in the world, both inside the country and outside it? at its independence in 1980. Indeed, following the guerrilla war and the end of direct colonial rule in 1980, Sanu PF was almost <coughs> universally popular in most of Zimbabwe. At that time, Zimbabwe was proud of possessing a number of educated political leaders. It also possessed sound infrastructure and a functioning economic system. This infrastructure and economic system had resulted from about 100 years of British colonial rule. In addition, events on the continent had given Zimbabwe's new leaders the chance to learn from history. 
The country also was home to numbers of trained Zimbabweans who had received a good education under the Rhodesian strategy of building a black middle class as a buffer between white settler society and the rest of the population, or as a result of the activities of missionaries. It was not in most quarters specifically stated, but it was tacitly expected that these educated Zimbabwean leaders and people would perform well with respect to maintaining and developing the economic, political, and social pillars of the state. Social reforms were quickly carried out by the incoming ZANU-PF government. The reforms led to improved access to services such as health and education for the majority. The remains of the Rhodesian system of apartheid, which had already begun to be dismantled during the war, the war were finally done away with. The reforms were a cause for more confidence in a ZANU-PF government that had been so popular. Zimbabweans soon boasted to others and to themselves that they were amongst the most literate and most intellectually accomplished of people on the African continent. 38 years after independence, Zimbabwe is on its knees socially, politically, and economically. Following leadership change in November last year, in an action that Zimbabweans coyly name the coup that was not a coup, has anyone heard that? <laughs> <laughs> the country is led de facto by a military government. The current president is only the second head of state to govern the country in nearly four decades. Unemployment stands as high as 95 by some estimates, 95%, although the government recently released a figure of 4%. <laughs> the financial system is living on borrowed time. Annual inflation was at more than 14% in 2017. The local currency is artificial and unexchangeable. Citizens are unable to access their cash from banks. There are no signs of corruption being meaningfully curbed. The budget deficit is 12% of GDP. The economic challenges have affected the government's ability to deliver social services. All the pillars of the Zimbabwean nation are very crumbled. What happened in Zimbabwe is that after independence, at the same time that it engaged in social reforms, ZANU-PF embarked on a strategy to entrench itself in power. The strategy of entrenchment had three principal components. Through propagating a glorious savior myth of its ascent to power, the ZANU-PF government bought time in which to entrench its rule. The first part of the ZANU-PF strategy of entrenchment was and remains control of the population. This was and continues to be done by controlling the media and, where necessary, by intimidation. And this intimidation deployed in the new state against citizens the practices of the guerrilla war. The second set of tactics involved neutralizing rivals. This was done in a number of ways. On the one hand, rivals were kept happy by buying them off. Another tactic was establishment of com complex corruption networks that say, served as an incentive for loyalty, but that also trapped individuals 
into silence and obedience. Where these tactics did not work, rivals were eliminated. The third feature of the entrenchment strategy was the holding of regular elections. The elections served to provide information about opposition patterns and to legitimize the standing government. Leaders were kept in line by a combination of carrot and stick, favor and fear incentives. The overall effect was a level of gleich schaltel a critical standardization of political, social, and economic institutions in the manner that was first seen with the National Socialist Government of Germany in the last century. The Zimbabwean people colluded in this internal colonization. In the beginning, most appeared too jubilant at what they took to be the defeat of the colonial regime to interrogate their new government. There were no objective voices raised in Zimbabwe when the triumphant guerrilla state and its armies marched into the country at the beginning of the internal colonization process. I remember women singing ecstatic but incredibly ill-advised songs at that time. For example, one of the songs exhorted Mr. Mugabe to get onto the women's backs because the women wanted to piggyback him in a towel. <laughs> there was no public critique of this kind of behavior from any quarter, nor do I remember any private critique. People went with the tide. It was a wild orgy of celebration. Today, some older Zimbabweans say, oh, we knew, we knew Mr. Mugabe this and Mr. Mugabe that. But at the time, they were silent. When pressed, they confessed that they were silent because they feared the incoming tribute demanding guerrilla state that had once been in exile and had now become the recognized national government within the country. Other Zimbabweans simply did not know anything beyond the celebrations they saw. These responses persist until today, decades after independence. To this day, many remain silent out of fear. Others chuckle and continue as before. Thus, whether conditioned by the media, terrified by intimidation, depleted of resources, or all of these, or none of these. The generality of the population was unable to organize any successful counteraction or to construct any significant alternative. The behaviors described above were performed by Zimbabweans. They were chosen and engaged in consciously. This is the crisis of personhood that I referred to earlier. The fact that needs to be faced is that even if colonial forces exerted pressure on Zimbabweans, it was possible at any point for any of the stakeholders concerned to choose to act differently. Yet virtually all the protagonists of the nation of Zimbabwe saw fit to behave in ways that resulted in Zimbabwe being the broken state that it is today. The Zimbabwean nation, both its leadership and its people, forsook responsibility as their nation tumbled to ruin. Even today, people and government blithely utter empty phrases such as, business as usual, open for business, and please pass the popcorn, even though their homeland is perishing. Zimbabweans as a nation have failed utterly to engage with the tragedy of its own implosion. 
I invoke three ideas to unpack this horrible state of affairs. The first idea is that of ignorance. The second is the idea of trauma. The idea of vicarious gratification is the third. Ignorance applies to both people and leadership. Quite obviously, a leadership that causes the destruction of its country must be ignorant of something essential. I won't go into that in any more detail. <laughs> the ignorance of the people derives from their need for a supreme authority that absolves them of personal engagement with and responsibility for the affairs of their nation. In its ignorance, the colonizing guerrilla state gladly takes over this role of supreme authority. It presents a particular image of itself and constructs a particular narrative around itself. Emerging from a period of direct colonial rule, followed by a ferocious war, in the absence of information to the contrary, the people believe the myth of itself that the guerrilla state constructs. With time, however, evidence of the dictatorial nature of the colonizing guerrilla state comes to light. It is an incremental process. With the standardization of information, news of atrocities comes in dribs and drabs. The atrocities themselves occur against people designated as being in some way other. They are dissidents, often due to ethnicity. They are foot soldiers of the European colonizing forces. They are opposition, or they are rural folk who are merely a resource for the guerrilla state and have no significance in and of themselves. Finally, as we hear today, they are Zimbabweans who do not have liberation war credentials. Over time, such categories of otherness with respect to the guerrilla state broaden to include more and more citizens. Eventually, each person in the population is confronted with the truth of the repressive nature of the internal colonizers. Every individual is faced sooner or later with the choice of either believing the new evidence concerning the nation's supreme authority or discounting this evidence. Whether the new evidence is accepted or rejected, its existence produces extreme levels of cognitive dissonance in the population as old beliefs are shaken. This cognitive dissonance is experienced as conflict and tension, in other words, as a nervous condition that exacerbates previous nervous conditions. As such, it leads to the second idea around the genesis of the crisis of African personhood. This is the idea of trauma. Nope. So I'm going to just go over trauma very quickly as well. I know that South Africa is engaging in a lot of work on trauma, so again, you probably know a lot more of it than I do. Um, but just to point out that in Zimbabwe, research by the government-established Organ for National Healing, Reconciliation and Integration found that Zimbabweans have suffered violence for close on a thousand years. As you know, suffering violence and the stresses that are associated with violence are a prime cause, cause of trauma. And so Zimbabweans have suffered violence for close on a thousand years. Initially, there were intertribal fights of rival kingdoms of the Shona-speaking groupings. These were followed by Roshi and Nguni invasions. After these invasions came a brutal colonization. 
following colonization, a liberation struggle in which almost no human atrocity was considered taboo was waged. At the end of the liberation struggle, people endured suppression and oppression under Robert Mugabe's government. Today, there is more of the same under the current leadership. The trauma inflicted on the people of Zimbabwe by the ZANU-PF government has a dimension not present in the other traumas I have mentioned. This is the element of betrayal of the people's faith. While dealing with the trauma of the atrocities themselves, people are also dealing with the effects of betrayal, which include shock, loss and grief, morbid preoccupation, damaged self-esteem, self-doubt and danger. Research has further revealed that prolonged exposure to trauma can change the hormonal environment in the body and that such hormonal changes can affect both the behavior of a traumatized person as well as the development of a fetus within a traumatized person. It has been found that prolonged exposure to trauma can affect the DNA structure in the body and that these changed structures of DNA can be inherited. Thus, it is possible that the traumas we have suffered in our part of the world have been encoded into our being through our genetic material. Zimbabweans and other peoples whose history includes colonization are traumatized beings whose behavior acts out the effects of this traumatization. The notion of trauma can help us to understand why both populations and their leaders on our continent choose to behave in unimaginably destructive ways. Both the leaders and the people are traumatized human beings. It's not quite as desperate as it sounds because just as DNA can be changed in one direction, it can also be changed in other, di um, in other directions. So there is hope. But I'll go on now to the third idea, that of vicarious gratification. And this flows from the notion of trauma. The acknowledgement at some level of experience, which need not be conscious that I have been injured and that I am vulnerable, induces the experience of powerlessness. To overcome this state of powerlessness, the individual who is experiencing powerlessness may identify consciously or unconsciously with a powerful entity in order to stake a claim in that power for the self that lacks power. The powerless person then connects psychologically and emotionally with the power holder and obtains vicarious gratification when this power holder wields her power over others. Thus, human beings who experience powerlessness can become ecstatic at the brutalization of other people who are perceived as powerless, and when sanctioned by a power holder, will participate in this brutalization of others also. It is incumbent on us to remember that this state of powerlessness has been experienced by our entire citizenry, the leaders and the led. Before obtaining positions of power, our leaders were amongst the powerless who were ruled by the colonial antagonists. And we also know that when they engaged in the fight against the colonial antagonists, they were often imprisoned and tortured and tortured, and so they suffered extreme kinds of trauma that we probably don't even know about. However, the authority of struggling for, liberations, for liberation then unleashed within them latent ferocity and bloodthirstiness. This unleashing of ruthlessness demonstrates one of the more pernicious 
attributes of this system of vicarious gratification. The powerless in the binary of powerful and powerless is ready at any moment to step into the shoes of the power holder. The only separation between them is opportunity. Understanding this, the power holder becomes more oppressive towards the powerless. The led and the leaders have become existentially entangled with each other. Another dimension of vicarious gratification is that we love to see black people suffer. We identify blackness as the source of suffering. Therefore, we are gratified when that blackness is punished in someone else. The punishment of the other means that the blackness has been punished already so that we ourselves will not have to be punished for being black. Ignorant, traumatized people who perceive themselves as powerless build dysfunctional nations. Theirs is a crisis of personhood. This condition culminates in crises in the nation's social, political, and economic institutions. So, as a continent, as nations, as individuals, we have a lot of work to do. We have to engage in the difficult labor of recreating our personhood in a manner that enables us to thrive. We need to renew our social, political, and economic institutions in order to create nations that flourish. We do this, as Bob Marley and Ngugi Wathiongo have informed us, by freeing our minds from the grip of the colonial antagonist. I am here tonight to argue that the creative economy is a foundational institution in achieving these goals. That the planet has arrived at a moment in its development where it is championing creative economies is not fortuitous. Developments over thousands of years have led to large-scale fabrication of the products that human beings need. This process of upscaling the production of goods beca began with the domesticating, excuse me, this process of upscaling the production of goods began with domesticating the provision of food through agriculture. Over time, the process of amplifying the provision of goods spread to other areas of endeavor such as the provision of clothing, the provision of shelter, and the provision of movement from one place to another. These processes, as Vice Chancellor has told us, were bound up with developments in technology. The rate of provision of goods increased exponentially with the advent of industrialization, which itself was driven by technological advances. Developments in technology require deployment of human beings' creative capacities. Thus, technological improvements were themselves creative processes. I am suggesting that no significant human advancement has ever taken place without tapping human creative potential. Today, technology is impacting all areas of human endeavor and experience at increasingly significant rates. This impact is also affecting that area of endeavor that we call the arts. Technology has impacted on the arts to the extent that provision of arts goods has in many countries been upscaled to an industrial level. Combining the creative processes of technology and the arts, 
we have today an area of endeavor that is called the creative industries. The system in which these creative industries function is called the creative economy. An economy is a system where value circulates. In the traditional economy, the things that are valued are resources such as land, labor, and raw materials. In the creative economy, those things that are valued are resources possessed by all individuals, namely the contents of our minds, our hearts, and our souls, and the manifestation of these contents as our emotions. The creative economy values those products that come from our imagination. Imagination comes from experience. So, our experience of our universe is our valuable resource in the creative economy. Africa has so far largely scorned the creative economy, discounting it as a frivolity and a distraction. At least that is how many of our governments have justified their attitude towards the creative economy. It is possible, though, that such statements are made to camouflage other intentions. It may well be that the line many African states have taken towards the creative economy is a pretext because the creative economy is uncommonly powerful. At the economic level, the creative economy puts products into markets. The news at the moment is about Nigerian-American author Tony Adeyemi's seven-figure book deal for her debut children's fantasy novel. Marvel Films has just celebrated Black Panther box office takings, surpassing the billion dollar mark around a month after the movie's release. I am sure there are many people in this room who have invested in Bitcoin, hands up, <laughs> and others who are devising new ways of doing things using blockchain technology, for example. Here at the university, we are all reading textbooks which have to be bought. It is a rare person indeed who does not switch the television on once in a while to listen to music. However, not only does the creative economy put products into markets, at the political level, the creative economy disseminates ideas. It offers people alternatives and gives them a voice in which a desire for alternatives may be expressed. By its nature, it works against totalitarianism. At the social level, the creative economy puts representations of the world into society and into our minds. When we engage with the products of the creative economy, its novels, its films, its music, technology, these become part of our experience. And so the creative economy also determines who we are and how we view the world. The creative economy affects how we relate to ourselves, to others, and to objects in our universe. It influences the values that societies embrace. It also allows us to revisit past experience in a way that reframes these experiences for us, thus freeing our minds from old patterns. Yes, it fashions and refashions the mind. As such, the creative economy is a wonderful invitation to us to recreate ourselves, our society, and its institutions. This recreation can be done in the image that we decide upon. In the past, astute governments prioritized those aspects of human creativity that revolutionized the material aspects of human existence. And this put a premium on physical raw materials. 
today, astute governments are increasingly championing also those aspects of human creativity that revolutionize the intangible aspects of our existence. And this puts a premium on incorporeal raw materials. This is where our trauma and our nervous conditions become the raw material that we use to create products that go on to refashion us in an uplifting manner. And I, I just wanted to say, I know this is true because I've done it. It is possible, of course, for a creative economy to create destructive products. It is common knowledge, however, over the course of, sorry, it is common knowledge how, over the course of half a millennium, the colonial antagonists produced creative economy products that vilified the colonial protagonist. Protectors of the colonial antagonistic mind continue to ensure, through gatekeeping, that the colonized protagonist does not express herself in a creatively redemptive manner. Beneficial creative economies require careful construction through appropriate strategies of education, funding, and distribution. Failure to ensure that the beneficial creative economies are constructed will have dire consequences. I'll illustrate what I mean by showing you two videos that demonstrate how Zimbabwe is being militarized by creative economy products. And uh, both of these videos feature one of, Zimbabwe's, one of Zimbabwe's most talented and popular young musicians. You might even have uh, come across this before now. Nigati dai wambota risanguba neguti shimwe pangwe me pocha uya asira mba uchi mo penya kunge suwa mama neza uno timdero cha uya ah mudara wajo shimwe noruma ah I think you get the picture. All right, so that was a huge hit just before. A Madara, an old man, came into government. And uh, here's the next one. Terminator 3, this is Terminator. Stalker's cash is backing a paid low crew that went down in the area over. Makamba, vachi fora, vachi kuira mukomo, anga vachi manya vaka bereka sumbo, davunga guti ameno kunde hondo, baro akariyo, eh kamuzambo, eh kariyo, muri se muri Zimbabwe na sinda ni nyama msugu ziba, but inya inona kita shogut, right? Chinoi seven. Movie premiere. It will be at the village, at Borodio, and it is a to move me. Say in number. So that is an advertisement for a movie that has been supported by the Zimbabwean Defence Forces called Chinoy Seven, and the song was about oh, I've seen a whole crowd of soldiers of heroes actually running up uh, the mountain. There's a war somewhere. So these are the creative products the creative economy products that are being um, produced in Zimbabwe at the moment. I believe that the collaboration of this young man uh, with the military resulted from dire need on his part. He approached me. Oh, sorry, thank you. Um, the young man approached me for help with his career 
before this collaboration with the military began. However, I was not able to assist that standardization that I talked about. I was not able to assist, and now this is the path he has taken. The militarization on the part of the government, however, is a deliberate action. The Daily News of this past Sunday reported 5,000 soldiers deployed to Zimbabwe's rural areas. To do what, you might ask, indeed, yes, that is the question. Therefore, it is of profound importance that we put in place strategies that will build creative economies that foster peace and the best within us. Zaitsem Da expounds on this point in his fine book, Justify the Enemy, Becoming Human in South Africa. In this text, Bra Zaitz reminds us that when we create narrative, our goal is not to create characters that are formulaically good or bad. Remember, I was talking about understanding our leaders also. So we don't want to create characters that are formulaically good or bad, but characters who are understandable in the light of their experiences. This is what he says, and I'm going to read quite a long quote because it is very important. When we black children of South Africa were growing up, we were taught by our parents, but especially by our grandparents, that we were not fully human until someone made us human. Humanity, our elders believed, was not something you were born with. Rather, it was endowed by other people. You were therefore a person because of other people. They called this philosophy Ubuntu in the Nguni language and Wotu in the Sotho languages. And how do others endow you with humanity? By giving you bounties of compassion and generosity. He says, I have since added tolerance to this list but I do not remember our elders mentioning that particular virtue. When you thank someone who had been compassionate and generous to you, you uttered the words, you have made me into a person. I'm sure we all know, many of us know that saying, huh? We have it too in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. As a beneficiary of Ubuntu, you had to make others into people too by showering them with compassion and generosity. Through deeds of compassion and generosity, you could attain a high level of humanity, a level that enabled you to show Ubuntu to the enemy. Adopting the method of justifying the enemy as Bra Zaitz exhorts us to, we produce characters that are fully human in the categories of both perpetrator and survivor. This does not only apply to narrative. It applies to all products of the creative economy, including technological products. We require a vision for tools of mass construction rather than weapons of mass destruction. By justifying the enemy in our creative ende endeavors, we act with compassion and generosity creating the potential for the humanizing of those who are enemies and for realizing an improved quality of humanity in ourselves. We claim a healthy humanity where justice takes its course in a merciful manner. South Africa is performing admirably in developing its creative economy. However, our creative economies will not succeed unless in addition to structuring them appropriately, we are able to scale adequately. The example everyone knows of successful scaling is Nollywood. This is why, as we develop our national creative economies, we must have the end goal in sight, that ultimately, these national eco uh, creative economies must feed into regional and also a continental creative economy. On this note, I conclude with a call to African leaders to invest astutely 
with the objective of improving life for all in the creative economy at national, regional, and continental level. I make my call to this continent, but especially to governments that are lagging behind in this respect, such as my own government in Zimbabwe. I hope President Mnangagwa will hear and heed this call. Finally, I have not had time to touch on some of the issues that are relevant here, such as gender. In that respect, I wonder whether anyone here had a question in the beginning when I spoke of some Zimbabwean filmmakers, female filmmakers, who wanted to make a film about postpartum depression. Was there perhaps a question that was muttered under someone's breath? Well, whether the question was on our minds this evening or not, I'd like to answer it. The answer is no. The women filmmakers did not get funding to make their documentaries. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.